This week on Triangulation, Claire Evans and a book called Broadband, the story of, yes, women who made a huge difference in technology, going all the way back to Lady Ada Lovelace. It's all coming up next on Triangulation. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 369, for Friday, October 19th, 2018. Claire Evans Broadband. Triangulation is brought to you by LastPass. Secure every password-protected entry point to your business. Join over 43,000 businesses and start managing and securing your company's passwords today. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get together with some of the most interesting people in technology and hear their stories, talk about tech, talk about the future. Joining me today, the, uh, a very interesting person, an excellent writer, and the author of a new book called Broadband, The Untold Story of Women Who Made the Internet. Claire L. Evans is here. Pop singer, Hello. journalist, and this is your first book. Congratulations. Thank you very much. That's, yes. That's exciting. It is. It um, is. Your you uh, the pop band I have to say interests me yacht. <laughs> yeah, what do you want to know? Well, it's good, and I, what it's interesting is it makes the the name of the book a triple pun because you're yes. in a band. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's good a point. band of sisters, <laughs> and it's broadband. So we got three. I like to operate on a minimum of three levels. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I like it. Uh, the, the first, in, I really loved the uh, the forward or the introduction uh, because it's your story, mm -hmm. and it's it's really. Um, I, first of all, I, your writing is fantastic. I really enjoy how you put this together, but also it's a very personal story. You have a a Dell computer. I'm sorry, you had to learn how on Windows, but that's, <laughs> that's how it is. Uh, she says, I've run every ran every Microsoft operating system from MS DOS to Windows 95, and you and you had get a life written across <laughs> the fr the frame of the Dell in Sharpie, which yep. I love, and you had and uh, over time it accumulated glitter, nail polish, and post-it <laughs> notes. It's a beautiful yeah. image about uh, taking something grim and beige and industrial, and making it your own. It's what teenage girls always do. <laughs> They yeah. always, you know, you gather all these little objects into your into your cave when you're that age, you know, stickers and, and concert tickets and notes from your friends. And you create this sort of strange little hermit crab castle of of things that you think define you. And the computer was a big part of that for me growing up because it was this one stop portal to all the possibilities of adulthood. I think I'm very fortunate in that I came of age in the, what I think are the golden years of the World Wide Web, you know, when there was still a lot of possibility, a lot of strangeness, a lot of discovery, a lot of randomness. You know, you would fall upon these strange subcultures while, you know, surfing hyperlinks across without any clear plan or mission and and find yourself in strange corners of the, of the web all the time. And I, I really came of age that way. And I felt um, I became a writer in that period of time as well. I began to sort of understand my text in relationship to the screen and the sort of feedback loop of seeing words on screen was really meaningful to me as a young woman. And, you know, as I grew older and blogging became something that you could authentically do for a living, kind of, I did a lot of that. And I always saw the computer as a kind of portal to the world, not necessarily gendered one way or the other, not for boys, not for girls. You know, it was just this way of pushing symbols around. And, quite meaningful for me. My father worked for Intel. So ah, um, ah. we always had, yes, we always had computers in the home and very early. And I think I also really loved the fact that, you know, my father's a very technical person and I'm a very sort of, you know, symbol oriented artist, artist, humanist, writer person. And, and we could share a love of the computer, you know, even from a very early age, even though we had different sort of vectors into it, uh, we both got value out of it. And I think that's, it's one of those kind of magical things about computing at its best is that there are many different ways that are valid of interfacing with them um, across all disciplines and fields. And I think that that was a meaningful thing for me growing up. And it was important for me to include that kind of personal narrative in my introduction to the book because I think everybody has their own 
their own path into this material. I like it when people do that because then I get to know you before you start talking about the the media. <laughs> before I start matter. bossing you around and telling you about <laughs> all the people that you, that you have to know about. Well, and I think you nailed it. You hit it, technology at an inflection point. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I, I'm an earlier generation, and in the earliest generation of Silicon Valley, anyways, very male dominated. Uh, although women had been a part of computing history going back in time, but but at that point, it was, it was a lot of guys in white short sleeve shirts with you know pocket protectors and skinny ties, and um, and it was an engineering thing, right? It was mm -hmm. it was all about the hardware, and it and right about that time that you got that Dell computer, it started becoming about software. The internet made it more about communication. You know, a computer by itself, it's not a, it's not much of a communication tool, but as soon as you get on the internet, that's all it's about. Uh, it, it became an, uh, a thing, uh, content became more important than the whole Yeah, and that was really my approach moving into writing the book. I mean, it's a book about women, but it's also just a book about you know, I've read a lot of tech histories. It's one of my favorite genre of book. And I think, you know, there tends to be this thing in tech history where, you know, historians, people are point, pointing at the machines and saying, like, this box changed the world. You know, right. this this machine did this. And it's true that, um, you know, a physical machine has a material presence in the world. Like, it's – they mass produce tens of thousands of them. They're, the world's landfills are full of computers that represent something important about the history of technology. But ultimately, they're just boxes. They're just, you know – they're just transmuted rocks until people start doing things with them and people start, you know, bringing meaning to the screen and 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 filling the containers with you know, with content, if you will. And that kind of sort of relational, human, social, community oriented, uh, user oriented kind of history is something that I think has been lacking. And it happens to coincide quite, you know, interestingly or dovetail quite interestingly with the history of female involvement in machines perhaps because software has always been a place where women could find purchase more easily in the computing industry than hardware why did what why did you what was what prompted you to write this book why did it need to be written well it needed to be written don't you think <laughs> oh i i think so but i'm just gonna give you a chance to say <laughs> i mean obviously um, it's been the story a uh, uh, male you know i, I think to, about hidden figures where suddenly we learn that it's women of white women of color who were so important to the early days of nasa and yeah uh, and that certainly opened a lot of people's eyes is it that is it analogous to that in a way it's funny i started writing this book Right when uh, Hidden Figures, the book had just come out and was, I think, being optioned into the film that became the massive phenomenon that it was. And I found that, you know, while talking to people, interviewing people for the book, you know, that that story, that Hidden Figures story had such a huge impact on the public perception of women's involvement in computing history that it really kind of changed the conversation. There all of a sudden became this much more, you know, widespread awareness of women's embodied relationship to computing history. So it's it's goes to show how powerful those narratives can be and how much they can affect the public perception of of what our history is, our shared history is. But yeah, I I you know, it's a similar thing for me. I have always been interested in women's stories, being one of course, and I've always been interested in computers and I've always been, you know, really attached to the experience of using computers and I think that I had this moment maybe three to five years ago where I started to kind of reevaluate my lifelong relationship to the internet. I think, as I mentioned earlier, I was of a generation uh, that really fell hard and fast for what the web represented and got a lot out of the web and you know, something changed. I don't know, the internet changed, I changed, the world changed and I started to feel as though my sense of self as a net native, as someone for whom the internet was my country, was kind of changing oh, because yeah. it became, it's become a little, you know, it's become harder to be a woman online than it perhaps used to be. There's always been bad actors, there's always been harassment and all that, even in the very earliest days of networked computing. But I think perhaps the increased emphasis on transparency and the lack of anonymity that we have as people in public space online, the vulnerability that that creates um, this sort of constant peanut gallery of criticism and feedback and harassment that is possible for any human woman that speaks about technology in public in a public space. All of that stuff started to make me feel as though I wasn't quite sure what my place was anymore uh, in this territory wow. that I'd always taken for granted as being my own. And so I think being someone who's interested in history and who likes to go you know deep down deep down rabbit holes, I decided that the best way to kind of reconcile 
that was to understand the history more thoroughly and to see what the lineage was and if there was a lineage that led up to and included someone like me. Uh, I'm not sure that the process of writing this book has entirely you know, given me a, a full understanding of how to be a woman on the internet in 2018, but it has given me an understanding of, um, you know, the rights that I have to these spaces, I guess, you know, like this is, computing is very much historically uh, a female domain and it helps to know that, you know, it helps, uh, it helps to feel as though I have some stake in this whole thing. Interesting. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, had it not been, I still would say you, you have an absolute right to be on the internet and safely on the internet and fully. In fact, one of the things that we always thought the internet would would be great for is that old New Yorker cartoon on the internet. No one knows you're a dog. You could write that yeah, on the internet. Sure. No one knows you're a girl. You you get to be empowered. You talk about your first learning HTML with your first uh, band music band website. Mm -hmm. I've got to think that's MySpace, right? No, earlier Not. than that. Yeah, well, I mean, this is probably like a little bit TMI, but my earliest what experiences creating websites were creating fan sites for the band Weezer. Oh, Aww. I didn't think I was going to say that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, they had a very strong uh, internet nerd fan community, as that's you can right. imagine. That's, right. that's how I learned how to make websites, so I could post pictures of Rivers Cuomo on the internet. Aww. Everybody has their point of entry. But yeah, I, <laughs> you're right. I mean, in the early days of the internet it was small enough and new enough to feel like something Everybody was other. welcome yeah 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 it was a new domain and we could start we could start anew and a lot of these early cyber culture thinkers that i so love and admire you know imagine that we'd be entering into this democratic realm the late yeah. john Perry barlow wrote yeah. about a civilization of the mind yeah. in cyberspace bless his heart and and all the early feminists to come online in the in the sort of late 80s early 90s um really wanted to claim the internet as, as a feminist space because they saw it as something that would be free from the boundaries of gender and that we could connect mind to mind without any of the limitation um you know and what happened Instead, which I, in retrospect, is fairly clear that you know, instead of creating this new territory, we just brought everything with us yeah. <laughs> into cyberspace because then we're people and we always do that. Um, you can't, you can't create a technology that gives you any real critical distance on the human experience. I don't think. You know, I think we invest ourselves too deeply, and we bring the good and the bad. So I think you know all that utopian idealism of the first generation is online. I look back at it with great fondness and I see it happening again and again with different things, you know, with blockchain or the decentralized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think we have to always remember that we can't improve. We can't improve matters uh, in technology unless we improve ourselves. Humans. Before yeah. We go into, yeah. Which is, you know, Gosh, a harder darn. proposition. You always got to have humans, don't you? They ruin I know everything. what a drag. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of those hippies who uh, really had that hot, those high hopes. And now you look back at John Perry. Uh, Barlow's uh, manifesto, and it's like, wow, that was naive. <laughs> why, 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 we were, why weren't we silly? Um, yeah, yeah, but you know, I think sometimes you need to have those kinds of texts as a jumping-off point, sure. if nothing else. Like, you you got to start with hope, right? I, mean, I honestly don't even believe that John Perry Barlow believed as naively in all of that stuff because he was so foundational, and you know, in the EFF, and he right. knew what, what he knew. was worth fighting for. You yeah. know, he wasn't yeah. he wasn't cool. But I think it's important to have these kind of luminary texts that we bring with us that that set at least our intentions uh, and and make it clear when we're deviating from an idealized uh, approach. So you start in the book. I mean, I think anybody who knows the history of computing knows the names of the kind of the earliest women in computing, Ada Lovelace, oh. who designed mm -hmm. with uh, Charles Babbage the inference engine and uh, Lord Byron's daughter. And uh, and go ahead. Yes, no, I mean, one is legally mandated to begin a history of women. Right. With someone like Ada Lovelace. That would have been laughed out of, you know. And, the, but you do field. spend time, and I really love it, with Grace Hopper, which is which is mm -hmm. fantastic. Amazing Grace is the name of the uh, the chapter. Yeah, um, and Grace Hopper is one of these figures that's really often trotted out as kind of, you know, foremother of women in computing and this important kind of sticker book character, you know. And I think it's really, you know, can sometimes be reductive to have these heroes because Grace Hopper was actually a very complex character. She had uh, a lot of issues. She she struggled a lot. She was in a very st strange and interesting and, and kind of a very dark period of history. I mean, she was doing she was doing computing that was being applied to you know warmongering essentially. I mean, she she 
worked on the central calculation implosion, you know, um, calculation for the atomic bomb. I mean, these are things, these are some of the darkest aspects of our history. And she also pushed really hard and was very tenacious during a very difficult period of the early computing industry, which is a fabulously interesting and complex character. And I think she's often reduced to the kind of like Grace Hopper on a t-shirt, right. uh, you know, you know, in, inspiring figure and, like all of these people, like all people, there's always so much more to the story and there's so much more nuance. And I think, you know, one of the things that I tried to resist in the book is, you know, lionizing people as as these kind of paper cutout sticker book characters, because it's great to have heroes and it's important for, you know, young women to see that women can succeed in this field and the representation is very key and there's obviously a lot of hunger for that representation, but I don't get anything out of a simplified hero. You know, I want good, to have, yeah. um, you know, I don't think that the alternative to great man history is great woman history. Right. I think it's more like this much more complex, messy human being history where we get to see how people interplay with one another, um, their foibles, their passions, their dramas, their idiosyncrasies, all that stuff makes it more interesting. And it's much more valuable and instructive to see how somebody overcame difficulty um, or, you know, succeeded in spite of certain things, uh, you know, because that's, that's, I can learn from that more easily than just some idealized heroine. And as you tell it, uh, Hopper is an inter Admiral Hopper is an interesting character because she bridges two eras of computing. She starts in an era, the mm -hmm. Hidden Figures era, where women were computers. They were yes. they were human computational <laughs> engines. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, the development of the modern computer comes from uh, human calculation efforts right. during World War II. Is right. you know these women working in the basement of the war theater doing ballistics calculations and then getting hired to, you know, essentially manage or operate the earliest mechanical computers in this sort of secretarial sort of telephone operator type capacity, not something that was considered to be uh, privileged or required any real intellect. It's not until those women actually endeavor to translate math onto these machines that uh, it was, it became apparent that uh, this was not an easy proposition and in fact required a great deal of sophisticated um, higher level systems thinking. Uh, and so, and so Grace was really instrumental in that period but then she took all of that thinking and that that knowledge and that sort of, uh, you know, everything that she learned from that period of history. And then she brought it with her into the early compute, commercial computing industry and really advocated for uh, what was then referred to as automatic programming, which was just this idea of moving beyond the machine level in order to code at a higher level of abstraction through, you know, the use of compilers and generators and assemblers and eventually programming languages. So... She's she's more than just someone who patched cables during the war. I mean, she's really someone who advanced the art significantly. You you talk about uh, a contemporary of hers in the fifties after the war, John Backus, who mm -hmm. uh, at IBM, who said uh, that that programmers were a priesthood in the fifties, guarding mm -hmm. skills and mysteries far too complex for ordinary mortals. <laughs> and she rebelled against that. She said, "No, humans should be able yeah. to write programs." Yeah, I mean, back in those days, I mean, this is before, this is before programming languages. This is before you could interface with the machine in any kind of, you know, symbols-oriented kind of way. This is writing programs at the binary level, at the machine level, really at the instruction set. So, you know, the the people that were able to do that in any kind of sophisticated way were, I mean, had limitless patience and <laughs> um, had a certain sense of probably hard-earned, uh, you know, proprietary kind of mysticism over the whole thing because they knew they knew what a dark art it was. And it's not so much that I think Grace wanted to break out of the priesthood, but she wanted to welcome as many people into it as possible. And she knew the only way to do that was to simplify the process, which would also in turn simplify the process of, you know, developing much more complex forms of software. So yes, she, she advocated for, um, you know, she was seen as kind of a space cadet for advocating for automatic programming, <laughs> but ultimately she was proven right. She wrote COBOL. Yeah. Which today Grandma is kind of deprecated. COBOL. In fact, even in probably in your time, people laughed at COBOL programmers, but <laughs> it was huge in the fifties at, uh, uh, the department of defense ran all its computers, as you say in here with COBOL insisted mm -hmm. that suppliers provide hardware that supported it, dictating the direction of computing for a decade. COBOL, mm -hmm. 10 years after its implementation was the most widely used programming language in the industry. And by the turn of the millennium, this most recent millennium was, yes. was the, the most 80% of all the code 
on the planet was written in COBOL. 70 billion lines of code. That's kind of mind-boggling. That's it a is huge success. It is a huge success. And it's, you know, I think it was a very well-timed intervention because at that period, uh, you know, after the war, as the commercial computing industry was developing, there there could have been, I mean, there kind of still was, but uh, a major sort of Tower of Babel problem where uh, everybody would be developing their own languages for their own specific hardware and there would be no interoperability uh, and it would be very difficult for, you know, software to keep up with hardware development, basically. So, um creating something that had, you know, that was interoperable, that was approachable, that used something close to natural language. I mean, COBOL is, is a toughie, but still it was much better than, you know, a elemental binary instruction set. Uh, that was really quite meaningful in terms of setting a uh, kind of base layer for how we were going to move forward as a, as a community into, into the sort of the future of, of computing. But then there's a gap. Uh, you know, probably more modern uh, times we're aware of, of, uh, of women very much part of, you know, the computing industry, not still on uh, parity with men, but certainly they're around. But you don't think of the 60s, the 70s, and even the 80s uh -huh. as, as were they having any. So pretend I know nothing about women in computing in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, because I don't. Uh, yeah. And it's all in here. And, and let's start with the with, with Cosmo called the computer girls. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, in the 60s, um, almost half of the workforce in the computing industry was, was still female. There were a lot of female sort of systems operators, programmers. Um, they were beginning to kind of cluster in the sort of lower status uh, part of the f industry. As it was key, key kind of menial, like a, yeah. like a telephone yeah. operator, right? But there were still, a, you know, a huge amount of women in the field. Uh, they were I data think entry that kind of. Types. Yes, lower level, less less sort of less of a supervising capacity, but more very much very much present in the field, and and right. for a long time, you know, the work of inputting and collating and and processing was seen as a, as a, as a woman's job, and women earned I think forty percent of computer science degrees at American universities until like really? nineteen eighty four. So I mean, that's fascinating. Yeah, there was a sizable female presence in computing for quite a while, but what happened? You know, well, everyone always asks me that, but there's a lot of different factors that I would say sort of inadvertently conspired to edge women out of the picture. There was, you know, always the usual stuff, you know, wage disparity and um, lack of childcare and lack of mentorship as that first generation of female programmers, Grace Hopper's generation, kind of aged out of the workplace. Um, but also sort of a shift in the professional credentials that were required and the educational requirements that were necessary to get a job as a programmer. Because in those, in the very early days, there was no you know, there weren't really computer science departments at school. You couldn't get a degree in programming. Programmers came, you know, into the field kind of sideways based on aptitudes. You know, they were good at puzzles or they did well in math or they worked their way up from, you know, data entry. And you didn't really need to have a specific degree or be part of any kind of professional organization to be a programmer. And hence that kind of priesthood thing where it was kind of this this field of misfits and, and weirdos who just happened to have the right aptitude to do the work, uh, many of whom were women. But as the field became more, you know, commercially viable and there was more investment, there was more development, it's sort of beside this question of, you know, these these wild card, you know, weirdo programmers who are sort of wandering in and doing their work became something that had to be more formalized, more professionalized. So, you know, there began to be different kinds of requirements, different um, associations. There was actually kind of the semantic shift that happened in the late 60s where people were no longer referred to as coders or programmers, but rather as software engineers, which, you know, has its own connotations about who is best qualified to do those kinds of jobs. So, there was this kind of slow, implicit masculinization that happened throughout the sort of 60s and, and 70s. And, you know, there's lots of great technology historians who are much more qualified than I am to sort of get into the nitty gritty of this stuff, many of whom I cite in the book. But the central idea is that if it, the field began as as feminine, it had to be made masculine uh, through various means. And I think that seems to have set a male dominant precedent that's only really reinforced itself over the years through frankly, marketing more than most things. If you look at, you know, ads for computing products from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they're, you know, you'll see a lot of like, so simple, even Susie can use it kind of uh, ad copy. And and then you look at like, you know, when I was a kid, 
movies and TV and commercials for computer games were always targeted towards young boys. I think about movies like Weird Science, where you know eight-year-old nebbish nerds <laughs> design their own dream girl uh, using the computer. There was just not our best moment. There was this kind of cultural force towards marketing and reinforcing this idea of computing as masculine. Yeah. I think it's, it did a lot of damage. It took a generation to to accomplish, but now we're in a position where uh, women are very much in the minority, and tech is perceived as being a boy's club, which is, you know, just historically straight up an anachronism. And I think it's important to remember that. We're going to take a little break. We're talking uh, right now with the author of a brand new book called Broadband, Claire L. Evans, the untold story of the women who made the internet. But as you can see, we haven't even gotten to the internet and there's a lot of <laughs> pre-internet stuff in there. The uh, yes. book is available not only, uh, you know, in, in actual physical dead tree form, but of course, uh, on Kindle, and Claire reads the Audible version of this, and uh, that I want to hear because you've got a great voice, and I think this will be fun to hear it in uh, your own words. So I'm going to get the I have the print, but I'm going to still get the Audible version. <laughs> of hey, we'll be back with more uh, in Claire Evans and broadband in just a little bit, but I wanted to tell you about LastPass. We uh, started using LastPass. Actually, I've used LastPass for almost 10 years. That's how long they've been around. And man, the minute I found out, I can keep all... I First of all, I can have good, long, strong, unguessable, unbrute forceable passwords, and I don't have to memorize them. I could put them all in a secure password vault. I was sold on the idea. Then we had Steve Gibson interview the creator of LastPass, and Steve looked at the source code. He, the, Joe Segrist showed him everything, and Steve said, this is incredible. He started using LastPass. Then something bad happened. Well, <laughs> one of our engineers could never remember the passwords to our web servers and to our bank accounts and everything else he needed to get into. So he made a, it's obvious, he made a web page with all his passwords, except it was public. That's when we decided that our company needed LastPass. LastPass Enterprise protects your company from, I don't want to say from its employees, but let me put it this way. 80, there was a study that showed that 81% of all employees share their passwords and not just with other employees. Bad passwords cause 81% of all the breaches in the world. And, uh, and, and so why don't you have some passwords protect you with LastPass? LastPass makes it easy. They can share passwords with, without you know, losing access to corporate data. I can actually give our accountant the password to our QuickBooks and our bank accounts, but she can't see them. She can't use them. She just use them to log in at her work computer. You have over 100 policies. Com you could set master password requirements. You can enable password resets, restrict access when needed. Uh, we actually force, force, force is a bad word, encourage force our employees to use two-factor authentication because we need to protect those passwords. And with the LastPass password generator, it's really easy to create unique passwords. And with LastPass's authenticator app, a verification button pops, pops up in the employee's phone. They don't have to enter a six-digit code or anything. They just say, yeah, I approve that login. That makes sure only they have access to those accounts. I can go on and on. I mean, LastPass is designed perfectly to keep your data safe. And, of course, your vault is encrypted and decrypted at the device level. Only data stored in the vault is kept secret, even from LastPass, of course, uh, the new password fill-in on iOS 12, I don't know if you've tried this yet, is fantastic. You know, you don't have to cut and paste passwords anymore. When you try to log into an app or a website, LastPass will fill it in for you. Same thing on Android Aureo. That is, couldn't be easier. And, when, and, and, and we're talking about the product used by 16.5 million people. People. It's the number one most preferred password manager. 43,000 businesses now use LastPass. We use it. There, are, uh, There's a LastPass for everybody. There's LastPass Premium for personal use. Uh, at home, we use LastPass Families. That way, I can share passwords with my wife. You know, she needs the PG&E, you know, the, the utility bill account. She needs the, the, the cable bill account. So I just share it with her. It's easy. It's simple. If she changes it, I get the new password. You know, it couldn't be better. There's also something, and I got to plug this because I really am a believer in this. And it's a little bit, you know, I, maybe it's morbid, but if you pass away, does your family have access to your bank accounts? Can they go in there and settle your your bills and do? 
Probably not, right? Unless you have LastPass. They have a new feature called Emergency Access that lets you designate somebody who can get access to your vault should you become incapacitated. There's a very nice kind of protection in there. Uh, I, won't, I won't go into the details of how it works, but it protects your passwords, and yet in in the event that they need it, your family can get access to it. I think that's important. That's a great reason to use LastPass at home. And, of course, LastPass teams for businesses of 50 or fewer and what we use, LastPass Enterprise. It is just awesome. It's, just, it's, not, it's a no-brainer. I know you're already using LastPass. I don't have to tell you. Make sure your boss knows about it. It's the first application I install when I set up a new phone or a new computer. It should be absolutely required in every business. Lastpass.com slash twit to find out more. Tell your boss. If you're the boss, don't let your employees <laughs> have access to the keys to the kingdom. Lastpass.com slash twit. Now, let's get back to Claire and broadband. Broadband is our topic today. We're talking about women in tech and i don't think you'd have to, everybody understands two things first of all the history of technology has underrepresented women in fact in some eras there's no women mentioned at all mm -hmm. uh and secondly that we have a big we actually i'm going to say three things we have a big hiring crisis because not women are not i was stunned to hear that 40 percent of computer science graduates were women in the 50s that because it's now what five percent ten percent it's dropped dramatically Mm -hmm. And third, it ain't easy being a woman on the a woman on the internet these days. So much so that a lot of women choose not to use gender neutral uh, handles. Yeah, it's always been a little bit weird to be female online. I think one of the things that really struck me in this research was when I was writing a chapter about early, early online communities, I'm talking BBS systems from the late 80s, um, you know, the kinds of problems that women face online today were were already there in the late 80s. I mean, there were already women complaining about harassment, women having um, issues with, you know, being kind of constantly bothered by other male users. And a lot of people would choose gender neutral or male pseudonyms in those spaces, just, you know, not to be bothered. And frankly, it was, that's frankly, one advantage of the internet is you could do that. If you're a woman in the workplace, we yeah, know harder. now, thanks to the Me Too movement, you're, you're, you're screwed. Well, that's a bad <laughs> ch choice of words, but you're, it's not good. Um, so it's not great. I mean, it's not good when there's no accountability and it's yeah. not good when, yeah, when you're not hurt. And you shouldn't have to hide. Work. Yes. You should be able to be yourself. Exactly. Yes. But, you know, it's 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 a complex issue. It always has been. There are many ways that we can work together to make it better for everyone without, you know, changing the discourse too radically. I think it's just comes down to fundamentally being decent to other people on the Internet, which is something that we have struggled with even from the very beginning. But, you know, a good rule of thumb is, you know, don't say things to people online that you wouldn't say to them to their face. Right. It was true then and it's true now. And and I do want to say that this is not a, a, a manifesto. Uh, this is not about, you know, the abuse women take on the Internet. This is a, a real history that brings out, I have to say, brings out some fascinating stories. I, when I first got on a system called CompuServe, one of my first mm -hmm. online experiences, spent literally hundreds of hours. Fortunately, I was on a comp account. Because uh, I had to dial it up, put the modem, you don't remember this, put the modem in the cups suction cups in the cradle yeah and, and pray nobody picked up the extension while i wandered through colossal cave which yes. was you know i had played pong i maybe i had an atari but man that was to me that was the best experience i'd ever had i was immersed in that cave what i didn't know until i read your book is that it's a virtual map of mammoth cave mm-hmm mm -hmm. yeah i got very sort of I could have written an entire book about that chapter. This is frankly. fascinating. It's endlessly fascinating. But yeah, the the game adventure originally, then like Colossal Cave Adventure, was uh, written by a man, William Crowther, who was had been a very avid caver and was part of a caving community in Kentucky of people exploring and charting Mammoth Cave, the largest cave in the world. Um, and his ex-wife, Pat was part of the party that made a very, very important discovery about Mammoth Cave, which substantiated it as the largest cave in the world. It's known as the Everest of speleology. She connected two cave systems in Kentucky and proved definitively that uh, Mammoth Cave was 435 miles long, I believe. Wow. So she's this kind of legendary 
uh, caver, this this tiny woman who was able to pass through a very small passage between two caves and make this important symbolic link between these two cave systems. And I find it so fascinating and remarkable that um, you know her husband, who worked on the ARPANET at, uh, at BBS, um, he or BBN, um, he made links with routers. I mean, he was a he he wrote the uh, the software for the earliest um, routers on the ARPANET. So, what a strange co- connection and a story about connection. And ultimately, he wrote Colossal Cave Adventure based on a section of that cave that he and his wife had mapped together. Uh, and before, by their, the, before their divorce, uh, mm-hmm. that's the that's the really fascinating thing. He was broken up about the divorce. And wrote the adventure. Yeah, because he and his, I mean, he and Pat had been the the mapping crew on these caving expeditions. And the important thing to remember about caving is that, you know, there's no way to summit a cave. It's not like you climb to the top of the mountain and look down and see what you've done. The only way to accomplish, you know, having gone through an entire cave is to create a map of it. That is, that is the caving community's equivalent of summiting. So the people making maps are these really important members of the team and, and Will and Pat had been making computerized maps because they were both programmers and they were some of the earliest computerized maps ever made of caves and they would go and plot these maps from you know their survey guidebooks and and make these massive you know plotted rolls of, of of maps and so and that's the same computer that they used to plot those maps ultimately was uh, ruggedized and became an early ARPANET router so it's this weird story of 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 connection and coincidence and and um, quite beautiful and I think you know. I, I chose to include that story because I think it shows how human all of this is. You know, I think we often forget how human technology really is. And we have this sense of the internet or of whatever our you know platform of choice is uh, as being something that fell fully formed from the sky, uh, completed and finished and unchangeable. Uh, we had this kind of fatalistic attitude about about technology. But everything that we use is the consequence of a lot of decisions and and very specific human stories. I mean, perhaps a broken-hearted person wrote this game that changed your life, or perhaps you know a, a hard-working programmer, you know, who cut her teeth during World War II, created this this language that then became the backbone of all modern you know computers, and partially was responsible for Y2K. I mean, all of these things are interrelated and and profoundly human. And I think once you realize that, and once you really fully kind of grok that, then it makes you realize how things are still very mutable and things are in flux and we don't have to accept things as they are. Um, we can we can move with things and make decisions and choices that, that can uh, influence the way that these these technologies turn out. I just, I have to read this uh, paragraph. Uh, Will stayed home to take care of their seven and eight year, or eight and six year old girls uh, and Pat went on to finish that Uh, mapping uh, adventure that connected the two caves. You write, when Pat came home deeply moved by the experience Will was waiting for her, they stayed up late holding each other and talking about the connection. When Will fell asleep, Pat crept to the teletype terminal in the living room and entered as quietly as she could the bearings of the survey they'd made in Kentucky. She ran a coordinate program and the data spooled into her hands in the form of a long paper tape. In the morning, Pat and Will brought the tape to his office, and she watched the BBN computer plot the link she'd made beneath the earth between two vast and lonely places. Now I can sleep, she wrote. I'm never going to... I know. I'm, I, and if you played Zork, by the way, that's just the more modern <laughs> version of, of Colossal Cave. So you've played... Almost everybody's played this game. And Yes. Yes. Wow. It's just kind of like... It's this foundational text of computer culture. I mean... Absolutely. Adventure is responsible for turning a lot of people onto computers and opening up the possibilities of what we could do with these machines. It's really one of the earliest kind of... I mean, it's the earliest computer game as we understand it today. And uh, just the idea that you could have fun or make something beautiful or, or artful or immersive using, you know, the vector of the screen and just some words is, it was, you know, a generation defining thing. Uh, it, uh, this is, it was kind of mind blown as I'm reading this. Mammoth cavers, the real world cave, who tried adventure found they needed no maps. It was so accurate. They could navigate it from memory as the game spread, adventure players who made pilgrimages to the real Mammoth Cave could scramble down the twisting passageways, secure in their knowledge of the game's virtual map. Wow. There's no yeah. uh, angry dwarfs throwing axes. There's no <laughs> XYZZY or plug, but... No, it, no battery dispensing machines or <laughs> underground volcanoes. But, uh, 
The core of it is there. I I literally gasped when I when I uh, oh. read that. That was that that. Yeah, it's a hell of a story. And the funny thing is, it's I mean, the story of adventure is something that's it's really been trotted out a lot in tech histories as being this kind of you know this important foundational story about this guy who was a caver and. I, and I had read the story many times in many forms, and it was only as I was kind of nosing around the footnotes of one or one or another one of these tellings that I realized that there was a huge missing piece, which was the story of Patricia, uh, you know, yeah. who was, who was uh, at Will's side in all these caving expeditions that formed his understanding of, of that space and who, you know, who catalyzed um, his desire to make this program and that he had made this program for his daughters. You know, he had never intended adventure to be played by anyone but his kids. He just happened to have left a compiled version of the game on an early version of the ARPANET no and it kidding. spread like wildfire as these things do. It was one of the first, you know, cultural documents to be viral <laughs> online, if you will, because right. it really propagated across every node of that early network. So, yeah. Wow, what a story. Now let's head into the 70s. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> This is so much fun for me because, oh, you know, good. as somebody uh, who is like you, read every computer history I can get my hands on, uh, it's 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 eye-opening to read kind of the stories that were buried of the women who were involved with this stuff. I was an early user of The Well. Uh, mm. I, I loved The Well. And, uh, and, of course, I credit Stuart Brand and all of that, but I didn't know anything about Sherry Raisin or... Uh, Project One. What is? Tell us about Project One. Project One is an interesting one. I mean, it's it was this commune in San Francisco. Well, the thing is, a lot of tech histories are really in love with this period and place yes. of time, which is San Francisco in the in the yeah, mid to late nineteen seventies. Interviewed John Markoff about what the Dormouse yeah, uh, said. Which and, great, you know, one of the great tech history books. Yeah. I think one of the better kind of human oriented yeah. histories, but. Yeah. You know, there is this kind of fantasy of the utopian ideals of of the early cyber thinkers on this in this time in the 70s of people, you know, who are really coming to understand the possibilities of what it would mean to bring people together uh, and to sort of inflect computing with the values of the counterculture of that time. Um, so there was this um, quite remarkable urban commune in San Francisco in those days called Project One, uh, just a warehouse south of market that. Uh, a group of several hundred hippies turned into a sort of working indoor village, if you will, like this weird ecosystem where everybody had little uh, little areas, little mini houses built inside of this massive warehouse. And a lot of different kind of cultural production offices were there. But they also had a quite large computer, an SDS 640, I believe. 940. Um, 940, yeah. oh, sorry. Uh, which they had procured... Because of the tenacity of really of really one By the woman, way, Pam. I'm correcting you only because I have the book in front of me. No, no, don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> I, I man, wouldn't have not, known otherwise. Man the SDS 940 today. It's not like, oh yeah, well, if you only if you knew, it's a no. <laughs> no I, it's because I'm looking at the chapter. <laughs> There's there is some scholarship to suggest that the SDS 940 that they had at Project One was the very same that Douglas Engelbart's lab had. That was no. an early note of. Arpanet at wow. Stanford. So it's another one of these kind of mystical machines that's connected to a lot of human stories. But they these this group of hippies who were living in an old candy factory, uh, you know, in the 70s in San Francisco had managed to get their hands on a very expensive, significant piece of hardware because of the tenacity of one woman, this woman, Pam Hart English, who basically just called every single person she could think of fundraised and finally negotiated with uh, a leasing company that she would take this old piece of hardware off their hands as like a tax write-off and managed to bring this really powerful machine into the hands of the counterculture. And that machine was used uh, for this project called Community Memory, which is this very sort of important early kind of social network, I suppose. It was uh, a, a they, they had various different terminals around the Bay Area and hippies would use it I as a message it. board. Yep. Um, off-cited yep. in tech history as well. Uh, and it was, it, was, it was used for a number of different kind of uh, innovative community-oriented computing projects, um, one of which uh, was called the Social Services Resource Directory, which was a project that was uh, spearheaded and run by a group of women and really has not been written about in any other history that, as far as I know. Um, and it was this project to create a centralized database of social services for social workers in the Bay Area. So they basically called 
every single social worker, every domestic abuse shelter, every, you know, any place that would offer resources for people in need in the Bay Area and ask them to share information and pool information into this larger database that would then be distributed on paper to all the social service offices in the Bay Area. And it became this incredibly important uh, lifeline for a lot of people, uh, you know, people without resources, people without access to tools, if you will. Um, and it wasn't really sort of seen as a technological object because it was the database was printed out on paper and distributed because people, the people who used it could not afford, you know, teletype machines. Uh, but it was used by social services and social workers in the Bay Area until like 1996 or something. Um, <laughs> really like a massive sort of long running, unglamorous project. And something I think is interesting about this history and comes up a couple of times as well in different stories in the book is, um, you know, a, a kind of abiding and longstanding concern for caring for projects once they have been initiated. I think a lot of um, our thinking as a culture about what is worthy and what is uh, worth, you know, mythologizing in tech is this idea of serial entrepreneurship, of of founding companies and making a ton of money and, and aggregating a lot of users and then perhaps selling the, those companies and disarticulating the products from the users and uh, moving on to big, bigger and better and brighter and more exciting things. But there's something to be said for people who start things uh, and then continue to do them even if they're not glamorous or cool or interesting or lucrative. You know, something like the social services resource directory, which is really just an application of computing power to social good uh, that benefited nobody but the people in need. You know, it's something that we don't include in our prevailing mythologies about what makes tech cool and great, but it's actually what it should be all about, I think. And I think something that really deserves much more focus and attention. So, I don't know. That's what I think is remarkable about about Project One is this group of women working on this very tedious but very important um, database for for people in the Bay Area. You mentioned in the book, uh, and I wish I could find this picture. That Rolling Stone wrote an article about it in 1972, the profile of uh, Pam Hart English, which called it one of the greatest hustles of modern time, <laughs> and <laughs> yep. and featured a picture of her taken by Annie Leibovitz next to the uh, console. And I wish I could find that picture. I've been looking for it. I can send it to you. I have a copy of I it. Love I tried to, to see it for the book, but Annie Lee Boy, it's a, it's a tricky one. A little pricey. A little pricey. Little but yes, expensive. I mean, she was the sort of like mother of this weird group of of, um, of hippies working towards the application of computing to social good. Uh, you know, what a hero. And it's interesting because it's a proto version of, I think, what, boy, I hope this isn't sexist. Slap me around if it's wrong. Uh, what you. women have brought to the internet, which is instead of this kind of um, I, you know, there are plenty of female engineers who think in ones and zeros and black and white, but instead of using technology to launch missiles, use technology <laughs> to bring us together and to help one another. And in the 70s, that was pretty early days to be doing that. I think nowadays with the Internet, we kind of are, are more aware of how that's happened. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I don't think that's incorrect. I think that, you know, I always hesitate to think that or to say that women are essentially better or more interested at one pursuit over another. Yes, but I, I do that think too. that yeah. throughout technology history, these spaces which have allowed purchase for women tend to have been these more user-oriented spaces, partially because they're not as privileged uh, in the field. You know, I think software was seen as less than hardware for a mm -hmm. long time, and it wasn't until, you know, its importance became apparent that the the primarily female uh, group of people that was working in, in that field got kind of edged out and that happens a lot um and and things like yeah the application community applications early community building a lot of that was spearheaded by women who had an interest in that kind of thing but also um who saw it as a place where they could make a mark uh much much more much with much more freedom and ease than perhaps you know writing programming languages or compilers or entering into the higher levels of academic computer science or uh, becoming hardware engineers or or things which perhaps were a bit more challenging in terms of the workplace. Uh, I, there's a whole chapter in the book about hypertext, um, which was an incredibly convivial field for women as well. And again, because I think it was seen uh, as being you know kind of soft social sciences, um, you know much more fluffy and and people oriented than than serious programming but ultimately became something that was you know became foundational to the way that we interface with each other in the modern world which is something that uh, a generation of female computer scientists and researchers realized um long before the web came along so 
there are these kind of points, these points of access that tend to be more user oriented historically that have allowed women to make an impact. But I don't think that necessarily means that women are like naturally good at doing that kind of thing. I think it's just the place where it works. And, um, you know, collectively you look at the history and you, and you see that kind of thing happening again and again. And, and I do think women have done an excellent job in that, in that domain. And I think women could have done an excellent job in, in any domain that they felt comfortable participating in ultimately. Uh, well, I, there's so many stories in here. I, I'm going to have to pick only a handful because we don't want to keep you all day. Although I have okay. known to do that. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I mentioned the well, of course, community one, uh, community memory and resource one and the SDS eventually kind of mi transmogrified into something called the whole earth electronic link that Larry brilliant and, uh, and Stuart Brand uh, started. And we've been talking about that in other interviews we've done on this show. We talk a lot about uh, computer history. And you mention a woman who's going to be in the studio in a couple of hours, Naomi Pierce, uh, in here. Oh, really? Yes, her husband Sal is coming on uh, uh, this afternoon. We're going to do a triangulation with Sal Segoyan. And Naomi's an old friend, dear friend, and um, was also on the well back in those days. Yes. She was yeah. one of the deadheads that populated uh, the well. On the well, yes. you use your handle was not was so short i think it was three letters that you could there was no gender on the well <laughs> uh, yeah well i mean i'm sure that there was i think i there's a chapter in the book about um an early social network called uh women's wire which was an offshoot of the well which was right. founded by right. uh, a couple of wellheads who felt as though you know, it was supposed to be this whole earth electronic link that represented all all people, but ultimately it was a bunch of, you know, m mid thirties white guys, and so they 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 went off and started their own uh, service explicitly targeted to to women called Women's Wire, which I was ultimately became where all the women went. Women dot com. Yeah, they all left. <laughs> oh, it's one of those mid thirties white guys. I was going, where where did they all go? All right. Uh, yes, they started. A, they started another service, which ultimately became Women. dot com, and, oh, and yeah. was like a massive like dot com era boom boom time company. Kind of another remarkable story in in of its own. Uh, but yes, there were there were several offshoot kind of BBSs that were that had you know slightly better parity than than right. the well. The well, of course, is a, is a marvelous and foundational place. There's a chapter in the book about this woman, Stacy Horn, who founded the kind of East Coast equivalent of the well, uh, a service called Echo. Which right. at a time when the internet was, you know, really like about ten to fifteen percent female, Echo had a forty percent female user base, and all of its moderators, um, every conversation was moderated by two hosts, a male host and a female host. So she worked really hard to create a system that would be more welcoming to women than other services that she'd experienced have been. And uh, it's another one of these, you know, amazing early internet communities that still exists and is still. Uh, Unix based. Echo is, is still really, around. Echo is still around. I got it. I got a membership uh, when I was writing the book. It's it's there is still an active community of hardcore uh, users, just as the well is still around. I mean, some people you find your community and you stick with it, yeah. and I think that's that's admirable too. And ultimately, you know, I don't know, having a a Unix based BBS that has lasted since 1989 it's, it's that's an incredible feat of of you know again of technological care and stewardship and it's become this remarkable historical document I and mean, if you go and look at echo and you you know you search for 911 or the anita hill hearings wow. or the oj simpson bronco chase you can find conversations that happened in real time as those things were going down and it's and it's absolutely remarkable because you can really see how you know, real people lived and thought and talked about these things. It's probably not going to be able to do that, you know, in 20 years time for Facebook or for Twitter. It's going to be much harder um, to search that material and, and actually make it useful. So the, the, there's the some Echo great is, there. is not exactly easy to use. You have to SSH into it. The commands are things like J and then a three letter abbreviation to join a group. Then you have to use zero to say who's online. I mean, it's not, it's a non-trivial it's non-trivial. And I think that's part of its appeal. That. Yeah. For me, I mean, my as a, I guess I suppose I'm a millennial. I think I'm an, a slightly older millennial. But, you know, there is something really appealing about that kind of thing. I mean, when I was writing this book, I was spending a lot of time on BBSs, on multi-user domains and moos and mushes and these kind of strange yes. early internet spaces just to sort of understand the physics of it all. And I kept it, it really honestly blew my mind. I, my, the only comparison I can think of is, 
you know, when I was a teenager and I realized that when you put a needle on a vinyl record, it makes sound like, you know, this technology that that seemed to be so self-apparent for a generation previous, when you discover it when you're younger, it's it's to know that you can still to this day go to a multi-user domain and, you know, and like chat to people in a simulated text space uh, using this very specific kind of physics and that there are still people there and that it still works and you can just, you know, dial into it through the terminal on your Mac. I mean, there's something kind of magical about that, sort of peeling back all of the layers of all of the semantics and all of the symbolism and all of the capitalism and all of the centralization and all the stuff that has come afterwards um, to go back to the sort of skeletal original thing and just actually have a conversation with somebody is genuinely kind of magic feeling. And I, I, I sort of have a pet theory that millennials will get really into BBS as a sort of reactionary I love analog that. thing. I don't think it's, I don't think I'm right, but I really <laughs> want to be right. And they'll all be playing Colossal Cave Adventure and we'll be playing weird door games on BBSs and and you know I don't who knows I look knows? At, I look at the our, we have a 15 year old and I look at him and the games he plays with his friends a lot of them are eight bit games that look a lot like the games you know I played on my Atari VCS they're very primitive mm -hmm. and they love those old games so. You know, the physics of what makes things feel real and immersive isn't about how high res and high def and you know like fast things are it's about like you know collaboration with others. I think you can be in the most 8-bit environment and if you're chatting to somebody in real time, you might as well be like on the holodeck because it works. Right. You know? And I think that's I think people are starting to realize that. You don't need to throw a bunch of resources into, you know, skinning something so it looks hyper real. Ultimately, that's just creepy. Um I'd rather <laughs> That's have, right. I'd rather just have fun, you know. The brain is much better than a uh, than a Xeon based uh, Well, that's computer. why we we still write books, right? I mean, it's just yeah. words on paper, yeah. but it still sucks us into the story. Uh as Perhaps more evocatively than a film or any or any other form of media. It's, I still I'm still a big adherent uh, of the theater of the mind that happens when you just read a book. We're uh, talking to Claire L. Evans. She's the author of Broadband, a new book about the untold story of the women who made the internet. I think you'd sell yourself short with that subtitle because it's really so much more than that. It's really these great anecdotes and stories about the history of computing. And Thank you. Naturally, there's plenty of women throughout women like jake feinler fascinating story who was yeah. downstairs from doug engelbart <laughs> yeah yeah at the stanford augmentation lab she she is a extremely fascinating character and i actually just had the honor of inducting her into the oh. women in technology international hall of fame nice. because of the book um she was the sort of central organizing force of the early arpanet i mean when the arpanet was coming together there was no way to search for the resources that you needed if you were trying to access another computer on the network, the only way that you would find out how to and where, how to connect and where the things that you needed to connect to were, were by calling this office at Stanford called the NIC, the Network Information Center, which was run by Jake Feinler, this this woman who was an information scientist, a librarian essentially, and she she just, she answered the phone for the internet for. 17 years, I believe. And people are always blown away when I tell them that, that there was a phone number you could call for the internet if you had a question. And it was it used to just be one phone, and then it was a bank of 10 phones ringing off the hook 24 hours a day because, of course, the thing grew exponentially. But Jake and her staff, which was mostly female, you know, they answered that phone. They created the early documentation for the ARPANET. They created the sort of yellow pages and white pages. They created who is. Um, she's responsible for, you know, the idea of naming different domains, .com, .edu, .gov. So she's this very sort of structurally foundational central figure uh, in the development of the ARPANET. And she's been like almost completely written out of the history until now, which is just truly nuts when you actually talk to her because she was, you know, she was coming in at three in the morning and leaving, you know, after midnight, you know, every day, pulling all nighters with people in the lab, like trying to keep the internet online and keep it in check in these wow. very, very early formational periods. And she's very humble about it. Um, but a really a remarkable woman, interesting woman who had a, a really a first person view on the development of this unprecedented thing. And uh, she's in her, you know, seven, late seventies now. And she's finally kind of getting recognition Good. and it makes so happy because she's really such a cool lady and um, it's important it's important to to you know give these people their their due while they're still with us there's uh before there was tim berners lee and the world wide web before our friend bill atkinson wrote hypercard there was kathy marshall mm -hmm. at xerox mm -hmm. park and uh, yeah yeah go ahead yeah hypertext is an amazing thing because 
you know, before the World Wide Web came along, there was a whole research community of people working in hypertext for nearly 10 years developing systems that weren't built on the backbone of the internet, but which, you know, worked out all the fundamental physics of how we're, how we should link ideas together, how we should, you know, um, make it so that this massive amount of digitized information that computer memory makes possible can actually be navigated and, you know, um, transformed into useful, applicable, you know, real world knowledge through linking. And there was a lot of uh, really interesting and intelligent and bright and, um, you know, forward thinking women building systems um, that would help us do that, help us make connections, help us uh, both on the sort of an argumentation side, um, you know, like Kathy Marshall at, at Xerox Park worked on the system called Note Cards, which uh, predated HyperCard, which was a similar kind of system of, you know, linking these little cards, like you, like the way that you write, you know, your junior high papers, like with index cards, three by five index cards linked together um, across, you know, as though they were pinned on a corkboard with string and then getting more and more sophisticated, of course. And so, yeah, and so when by the time the web came along, you know, the entire hypertext community took one look at it and thought that it wasn't going to go anywhere because, you know, the links on the web were contextual. They were embedded in documents. They could break. Um, you know, there was the possibility of what we now call a 404 error. And all these earlier hypertext systems, links could go in two directions. Links could go in multiple places. Links could be scaled and changed depending on the user. So you could get a more sort of sophisticated set of links for someone with, who's a more advanced user. There was much more kind of granular sort of control and specificity over what you could do with these systems. But um, I think the web was radically simple and free and online, and that made it so that it eclipsed all of these other earlier hypertext systems. But I think it's always important to remember uh, from whence technologies emerge. I mean, the web is one of those things where, you know, it borrowed a lot of concepts from these earlier systems, but it's more like these earlier systems created the conditions for the web to emerge because there was an ongoing discourse for a long time about how best to approach this issue. And you know, Tim Berners-Lee kind of came at it sideways, ultimately. There's a really great story, which I believe is in the book, although I can't remember if, how much detail I go into it. But the very first time the World Wide Web was demonstrated um, in the United States was at Hypertext 91, the 1991 Hypertext Conference in San Antonio, Texas. And Tim Berners-Lee's paper about the web didn't get accepted to the conference for whatever <laughs> reason. I think because the hypertext community saw it as being, you know, kind of a lesser than technology. Right. But he came anyway, and he and he lugged his you know ten thousand dollar Next Cube on his own dime from CERN, and he set it up in sort of the demos period of the conference, which was after all of the papers and and talks of the day, uh, simultaneous with the kind of meet and greet cocktail hour of the conference. And so there's this anecdote that several people who were there have told me, which is that the very first time the web was being demonstrated to anyone who might be interested in, in the United States, everybody was outside drinking margaritas because <laughs> there was a margarita fountain as part of the cocktail <laughs> hour. This is San Antonio in the summer. And so all of these hypertext people were in the courtyard getting, you know, blotto on margaritas and nobody went to go look at the web because they were like, eh, who cares? And there is one photo of Tim Berners-Lee at Hypertext 91. And if you look closely, you can see a margarita glass uh, <laughs> on the folding table right next to the next cube, which must have made him a little bit nervous. Uh, and it's remarkable to think that, you know, less than a year later, he was the king of the world, basically. I mean, he was the keynote speaker at the next Hypertext conference and the World Wide Web conferences came along and and Hypertext as a discipline kind of petered out. Uh, and these things happen very, you know, very, very quickly. But it's remarkable to think that there was a period in time where everybody was more interested in getting a free margarita <laughs> than looking at the web. Uh, you know, a little bit of context. It, it's a, kind of an example of where the perfect is the enemy, uh, enemy of the good. That uh, th they had Microcosm, which was written by Wendy Hall, and they had these. You know, it was really sophisticated. And Tim is showing something that's you know kind of primitive. And they thought, yeah. well, uh, you know, okay, nice, nice little demo you got there, but <laughs> we got something yep. much better. Yeah, and it happens all the time like that in tech. And I, you know, that sometimes that has to be the way it is. And I think ultimately, you know, the fact that we can have dead ends on the web, which was considered to be this kind of the fun, the fundamental reason why it would be um, not a valuable hypertext technology. Uh, you know, the fact that we have 404 errors, I think ultimately is a good thing because it allows us to sort of, I don't know, like the natural decay of things uh, is important on a certain level. And the fact that, you know, the web is often kind of sort of shedding its past and reinventing itself and rewriting itself is part of what I think has made it 
such a lasting and powerful thing. And yes, the simplicity of it, you know, I think academics have a hard time with simplicity and that's, you know, they saw that as a flaw, but I think it ultimately was an advantage. Yeah. But I do often think about what would happen if one of, you know, what would have happened in the parallel future if, you know, one of these other more sophisticated systems had taken off in the same way that the web did, you know, what kind of internet would we be using today if, all links went in two directions or multiple directions or, you know, there was much more kind of granular accountability about sourcing and attribution. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we would be a more living in a more civil world, perhaps. Maybe we wouldn't even be interested in the Internet because it wouldn't have the same affordances as it has today. But I do think it's it's always satisfying to ponder the, the potential parallel possibilities of history. So many uh, great uh, stories in here, uh, in, and so well written. They're, it's really engaging. It draws you in. Uh, it is not a polemic by any means. Although I think when you get to the end of it, you might say, "Boy, it's a shame that uh, we never heard these stories uh, before." Is there one story uh, that you, that I haven't brought up? One person that I haven't brought up that you think ought to be uh, better remembered? Oh boy, I think you've done a pretty good survey of okay. all the the heavy hitters in the book. I mean, the thing is that's important for me to remember and to state uh, is that. I really don't want this book to be, you know, oh, it's done now. You know, like the book's done. The, you know, the stories have been told. We're good. You know, we've covered it because there's tons and tons, tons of yeah. stuff that I wasn't able to put in the book just for the length, for the sake of length and the sake of narrative. But there are many other stories I wish I could have told. I had, I wish I could have included that I hope other people will take on and tell because there really is just a, kind of a maddening wealth of material, actually. I mean, the fact that, you know, we always hear the same 10 stories, you know, about like Steve Jobs hiring the guy from Pepsi or whatever, like when there's all this other stuff that is just as interesting and tantalizing and and provides this, you know, for me, it's it's not so much about creating some kind of counter history. It's about adding more complexity to the history that we have. Like we have the foundation. We understand the stories that have brought us to where we are today. Now here's a bunch more that complicate those narratives and and just show you the perspective from someone standing in a different part of the room and looking at the same thing. You know, what what else can we learn about this incredibly important, you know, transformative period in our technological history? Um, why don't we take a look at the people that were also in the room who might have had a different perspective on that? Uh, I think it only enriches it and I, it only brings more nuance and, and more subtlety and more complexity to the story, which for me is makes for a better story. Yeah, it doesn't complicate it, it enriches it. And, Thank you. And, yep. and this is a definitely an enriching a book. The book is Broadband, The Untold Story of the Women Who Made the Internet, but also everything else that we use today. Claire yep. L. Evans. Uh, it's available uh, everywhere from Penguin. And uh, there's a great audio version of it that Claire reads at audible.com. I know a lot of you use Audible. Um, it's a it's a it's a great read. It's very engaging, and I'm so glad we could spend some time together. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Really this has been really fun. It. Broadband, everybody, buy it now. Thank you, <laughs> ClaireLEvans.com. If you want to uh, get a copy, that's probably the best place to do it. ClaireLEvans.com. Thanks, Claire. That'll do it. Thank you so much. Take care. We'll talk about yacht another time. Okay. I love the music. Oh, thank you yeah, very much. It's really good. Thank you. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's so funny because uh, we like to pigeonhole people. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. She's a writer. She's an editor, whatever. And uh, why can't you be a pop star and a great writer and everything else? You know, people yeah. write, writing songs and writing books is definitely not the same thing, no. but it does take some of the same, um, I don't know, Muscles? dedication. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, good. Living. Good. Well, you can find Yacht on uh, YouTube if you want to hear some of their music. Uh, thank you. Take care, Claire. All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye. We do triangulation every, uh, well, it varies. <laughs> I was going to say every Friday at 3 p.m. Pacific, but in fact, this was done at noon, so that doesn't work. Uh, but keep an eye on the schedule at twit.tv slash calendar because it's always fun. It's always interesting. Some of the best, most interesting people in technology we do a our best to bring them to you on triangulation. And if you watch live, you could participate by uh, chatting in the chat room at irc.twit.tv. Uh, we will have a show 3 p.m. Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC. Sal Segoyan will be joining us uh, to later today with Naomi Pierce, his wife. Uh, but anytime, what, I, is he, are they married? Or I think they are. <laughs> I hope I'm not marrying them. Uh, but in, inappropriately, but I believe they are. <laughs> anyway, Sal will be here to talk about Apple Script Automator and the future 
uh, of uh, automated uh, systems um, on triangulation. And there'll be another great one next week and the week after, too. So make sure you, uh, you tune in. And better yet, just subscribe. If you go to twit.tv slash TRI, you can download every episode. Look for people that interest you. There's a picture of me with Daniel Suarez, author of Demon and Freedom. We've had some great interviews with Bill Atkinson, the creator of Hypercard. Uh, Adam Fisher's new book, The Valley of Genius, interviews with the people who uh, created Silicon Valley, and on and on and on. Uh, you'll find them all at twit.tv slash TRI. Megan and Jason uh, help out, too, of course. They do a lot of the interviews as well. And uh, if you uh, want, you could subscribe. There's a thought. That way your phone or your computer would be loaded up with great things to listen to whenever you're in the mood. Apple's podcasts, iHeartRadio, Overcast, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Google Play Music, Stitcher, SoundCloud. I can go on and on. We're everywhere. Subscribe that way you'll get every episode. Thanks for joining us, and I'll see you next time on Triangulation. Bye-bye.